So again, welcome everybody uh, to the Civics Project sponsored by Repair. I'm Beth Rebay, the founder of the Civics Project and director of Repair, and I'm really pleased to have you with us this week. Our topic this week focuses on the budget, specifically the U.S. federal budget. And I want to break down some basic concepts that I think are important in making sense of the budget. Now, I first want to just, as a basic premise, um, distinguish between the term budget and economy, right? There's a lot more that goes into making sense of the U.S. economy. The budget is solely the money that the government receives and the way and the money that the government spends. It's uh, spending and it's revenue. And we're going to talk about how that's structured and how we can study and learn more about the federal budget. Before we do, though, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Repair acknowledges the Tongva peoples, the Gabrielina Tongva peoples, as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar, the Los Angeles Basin, and South Channel Islands. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Tarachatom, the indigenous peoples in this place. We pay our respects to Hanukvatam, the ancestors, Ahihiram, the elders, and Eohinkem, our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. So returning to the subject of the U.S. federal budget, um, the budget is made up of primarily of all tax revenue that's generated by individuals, by families, and by corporations. The federal budget also includes some revenue, generally somewhere in the range of 60 to 70 billion, that comes in from tariff taxes, mostly on imported goods. Presently, the current annual revenue, so all the money that's flowing into the U.S. federal government is approximately $3.5 trillion. Okay, again, that's $3.5 trillion. And just to make sense in the most basic terms of what's a trillion dollars, we want to think of it in this way. Everyone understands what a million is. Most of us know that if you take a thousand millions, that makes up a billion. If you take a thousand billions, that's a trillion. So it's like a million times a thousand times a thousand again, or a million millions is a trillion. So the U.S. federal income, its revenue coming in each year right now is at about $3.5 trillion. And of that, close to $3 trillion, so most of it, is coming in through income taxes and payroll taxes. So most of that money is made by people in the United States working. And that includes work done by citizens, by non-citizens who are permanent residents or who have a green doc green card, and labor by undocumented persons. Um, federal spending, right? So what the government spends is currently listed as around $6.7 trillion. And that does not include for 2021 the current rescue package, which is going to add another approximately $1.9 trillion to this year's spending. So practically speaking, that means that our spending is at least, and there are new things emerging, but it's at least for this year going to be at $8.6 trillion. And with $3.5 trillion coming in, that means this year has a deficit, meaning how much more we're spending than we're bringing in at approximately a bit in excess, actually, of $5 trillion dollars. Now, there's an existing deficit that was there at the beginning of 2021. So when we enter January 2021, we already had a deficit of $28 trillion. And the rescue package this year and the deficit this year will push it to well over $30 trillion by the end of this year. Just to give you a sense, with our current figure of $28 trillion approximately, if every taxpayer, every person who pays taxes in the United States, so this doesn't include children or anyone who's not required to pay taxes because they don't have significant income. So for every taxpayer to, to take part in, or children at least who don't have a lot of income, every taxpayer to take part in paying off this debt of $28 trillion today, per person it would take approximately $224,000 
So to just wipe out that debt, each of us who pays taxes would need to come up on average with that much money, which of course meant most people could not, since most people don't even earn that much in a year. So part of our goal is to figure out why do we have a budget that is so that is so far out of balance? And there are a bunch of different answers to that question. One today in 2021 and last year, of course, is the pandemic, right? It's had an incredibly damaging effect on the U.S. economy, created a lot of expense and caused people to... Uh, leave work or to earn less money. So it's created a lot of economic crisis and that's driven up the national debt beyond what it was, for instance, even at the beginning of 2020. But most of this debt uh, pre-existed the coronavirus pandemic. So we certainly can't just write it off to a present crisis. So let's try to get a picture of sort of where were things before. So I'm going to just jump back to this date um, in 2016. We were, so in March of 2016, we would have been, we had a national debt of about $19.4 trillion. So with $28 trillion now, what that means is that we've added about $8.4 trillion um, since Donald Trump was inaugurated. So of that current debt, a lot of it was accrued just in the last four years. So we can ask what exactly happened in that Trump presidency. We've never seen a jump like that in just four years. So one answer to that was a cut to corporate taxes, right? So many of you heard about the corporate tax bill early on. That wouldn't account for $8 trillion, but it was a piece of it because it gave corporations back more than $100 billion per year, which, of course, you know, anytime we don't have that money and have to borrow to get it instead, we're also paying interest. So it's really substantially more. And over time, that adds up. So those tax breaks in total are projected to amount to trillions over the years unless they're undone. Um, Military spending increased, and so that was one of the areas that helped to contribute, particularly over four years. Um, Let's see, some other things that occurred. We saw increasing personal debt in the last four years, and one of the things that happens when people are in more debt is they have less um, flexible income to spend and to contribute back into the economy. And so there was kind of less revenue being generated, more people just trying to pay down debt. So that was a part of it, right? Individual taxes did not go down significantly. Corporate taxes did. Military spending went up. Um, And spending to some areas of social services went down. But even though that temporarily saves, it also, again, increased personal debt, increased the economic burden on individuals, which meant that the economy as a whole suffered certain repercussions. So that helps to answer. And in in addition, we spent hundreds of billions of dollars each year just paying interest on all of the debt. So all of that helps explain why did the Trump presidency increase our national debt by approximately, uh, let's see, 8.6 or 8.4, I'm just looking at the figures again, actually $8.6 trillion. Um, But let's compare, let's think about where things were before. So I want to jump back now to 2008. And what we see is that when Barack Obama took office, so in March of 20, 2008, right, he had just been the president for a little less than two months, um, he was inheriting a national debt that was just under $10 trillion. Right? So one of the things that we see is though that it took the Obama presidencies longer uh, than it did Trump over eight years the national debt increased by about $9 trillion under the um, Obama-Biden White House. And there are a few reasons that we can understand that that happening. And the biggest one was that they inherited a recession, right? So some of you may remember the SNL crisis, the Great Recession, 
in 2007 and 2008. Uh, many political scientists and analysts indicate that the sort of crashing economy was one of the reasons why um, why Obama was elected, why, why people in the United States were very ready for a different president. And so the Obama-Biden response, there were a few different things that they could have done. One would be sort of more dramatic transformations of the U.S. economy, uh, but there's no indication that uh, the Congress in 2008 would have supported those kinds of deep, deep changes, and we can talk more later about what those would be. And so the Obama-Biden response was to pull the United States out of the recession by pumping money into the economy. And they succeeded. They pulled the United States out of an economic recession. They got more people back to work. Um, They um, managed the housing crisis, the SNL crisis, and got banking more stable. Um, And there were, and, uh, you know, as I said, people got back to work. Rates of unemployment steadily went down over most of the Obama presidency and a number of social programs were funded that helped meet the most pressing needs of the recession. So they got the economy up and running again, which was good, but they did so by uh, taking on a lot of debt. So what we see is that over about eight years, the Obama-Biden administration added, uh, basically doubled our national debt. And Trump then added another $9 trillion to that in just four years. So about $10 trillion over eight years for Obama and Biden and Trump in about four years. I want to jump back a little further. Why was there a recession, of course, is a much more complicated question than I could answer in a few minutes. But just to give folks a sense of where the national debt was in 2000, when George W. Bush had just taken office, so I'm looking back at figures from March of 2000, and what we see then is that we had a national debt that was um, at about, so this is before, or this is right after Bush took office, but before he had a chance to make much impact. So what he inherited from Bill Clinton was a national deficit, a national debt, sorry, different term, of about $5.7 trillion dollars. And at the time that George W. Bush took office, that deficit was going down. So what that meant basically is that, you know, I started off by saying that we've got this huge deficit between what we're bringing in per year and what the United States is projected to spend this year. In 2000, when when Bill Clinton left office, there was a surplus, meaning that while there was national debt of about $5.7 trillion, all of the U.S. tax revenue that was coming in exceeded U.S. spending by about $175 billion, right? So the U.S. could pay all its bills and pay its interest and then still had about $175 billion a year to be paying down that principle, right, to be making payments to reduce that deficit. So in the simplest terms, what George W. Bush inherited was some debt, but a balanced budget, a budget that was primed to pay off that deficit over time and was heading in that direction. And that recession pushed things in a different direction. And the Obama and Biden response, though it was certainly needed to save lives and get the economy running, um, really massively increased that debt beyond anything that we've ever seen. And what ideally would have been happening and what was what Obama and Biden at least had been trying to do towards the end of the presidency was to move towards debt reduction. Um, But some of you may remember that after the first couple years of Obama's presidency, the Democrats lost control of Congress. We had a split Congress, and then the Republicans took complete control. So we also didn't have an executive and legislative branch working in tandem to reduce that debt past those first two years of crisis management. So this is all short and oversimplified, but one way to understand why we entered Uh, 2016 and the Trump presidency with as much debt as we had is that we didn't have a federal government that could work in concert to bring it down while still continuing to rebuild the economy. 
And that w- then what we see is the problem got a lot worse and then the pandemic hit. Now, if folks are ready for a little more bad news, and sorry, but I got to bring it because that's part of the educational work. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the baby boomers. So most folks are probably quite familiar with that term, but just to define, we think of the baby boom generation as those who were born between 1946 and 1964, so that cohort. And at the time, it was the largest generation of people born in the United States. Uh, And 1946, as some of you may know, was just a year after World War II ended. So the baby boom is generally marked as this period in which people were coming home from war, many of whom had been drafted and were ready to have babies. And a lot of them did. And they were born the next year. And the context for that was also about a growth economy. This was a time, for instance, where the U.S. was solidly out of the Great Depression of the prior decades the prior period and uh, the earning potential that an average person, and there's really no such thing as an average person, but if we take statistical averages and think about what people could expect, at least for people with some class or racial privilege, one could expect with a high school degree to have the earning potential then that today requires a post-baccalaureate degree, a graduate degree, like a medical degree or a PhD or a law degree or an MBA, right? So earning potential was good. The economy was growing. People had babies and they had this very big generation. And one of the reasons this this is significant is that the baby boomers now are aged between 56 and 75. So uh, a good number of them have already entered retirement age and a number of them have already retired. And we are posed over the next decade for most of the baby boomers to enter retirement. Why is this very significant? Some of you can imagine. Uh, A big reason why it's very significant is that we're going to have a large portion of the population who won't be of working age and therefore won't have a lot of income taxes to pay into the government, but will be entitled to be getting Social Security income back from the government. And as you might imagine, with our government, which has $28 trillion today in debt, they don't have a reserve where they saved up all the Social Security withholding from people's paychecks over the years. So our government owes this money back to uh, people who are middle-aged, aging, and elderly, who have, pay- who have had this money withheld and given to the government out of their paychecks, and who expect it back to live on. But the United States government does not have it. It's spent that money. And just to give you a sense of sort of where are the medical entitlements or where the sort of Medicare and Social Security entitlements today, the United States total liability to pay off uh, Medicare and Social Security in terms of what people are already expecting, is over $50 trillion. So in addition to all this debt, the United States also owes that money in Social Security and Medicare payments back out. Now, not in one year, obviously. This is over time. This is what everybody's entitled to. But what they're projected to need to pay back out to baby boomers and to those who are older than the boomers Um, is going to be somewhere in that figure, right? So unfunded liabilities. So that's, um, and again, the the math is complicated because it's also a question of, you know, sort of how many people will live to certain life expectancies and what's the liability for, for people who are working and younger as opposed to those who are retired now or will retire over the past 10 years. So those figures are not exact, but that just gives you a sense, right? The United States doesn't just have all this debt to manage. It also has this aging generation, which has paid a lot into the economy, which has not been saved up for them. And which, as the U.S. practice has been, would be paid back out of the Social Security and Medicare withholding taxes from people who will be working now and in future. And just to give you a sense, what we would expect in about 10 years is that 
only about half of the U.S. population would be working age. So we'll have about 100, and, 100 million people who will be retirement age or older 10 years from now. Again, these figures are rough. And we're also going to have lots of kids who aren't earning money yet. Uh, not as many as we'll have elders, but we'll have, we expect about over 70 million children, right, who are not yet at working age. So if you want to picture where would we be in, let's say, 2031, 10 years from now, we would have about half the population that's working age, that's in an economy which has a ton of debt, and in which we have a lot of elders who need to be supported and who have understandable entitlements uh, that they expect back from the United States government. So, in essence, our budget is in rough shape. And some have referred to this crisis, the retirement of the baby boomers, as the silver tsunami, right, to kind of describe the, and I think that term is somewhat problematic, but I have mentioned it because it's also evocative to think about being overwhelmed by something we're unprepared for. It's not that people aging is a disaster, but the fact that our government has spent the Social Security and Medicare funds that our aging population has already had withheld from their paychecks is a significant problem. So we have a deeply unbalanced budget. We have a lot of debt where our, our economy is in crisis and we've got a lot of retirees. Now, this doesn't mean that there's no basis for hope or optimism, but one of the most vital steps is for the public to understand better what fiscal mismanagement has looked like, meaning how funds have been poorly used, how they've been mismanaged, and to have more input for the public to start monitoring and pushing for more responsible spending. Before I talk about what that might look like and some of the different proposals that are present in government today, one thing that I just want to acknowledge, you know, I had a student ask me recently in a class that I was teaching, um, well, when will this hit us? Like, at what point will the debt just catch up to us? And my answer was, well, it actually already has. When we're spending close to $400 billion a year just on interest, all of that money is flowing out of our tax dollars. So we're paying it to the government. It's just going into that debt. It's not coming back to us. It's not coming to education. It's not coming into our health care system. It's not coming into social welfare benefits programs that benefit people who are struggling economically. It's not protecting our environment. It's not stimulating our economy, right? The debt is actually, it actually means that we pay more out than we get back. Right? So our tax dollars are not feeding us, supporting us, sustaining us. Instead, they're going to manage that crisis. Yes, uh, one of our Zoom co- um, attendees is commenting that this is depressing. It's very depressing. It's very scary right, to understand how badly mismanaged our budget is. So let's talk about the positives. Why could we still be hopeful and what could happen that would work? Well, a good thing to keep in mind is that we've got 332 million people in the United States. And 332 million people, even if just a substantial portion of them are working in concert, can earn a lot of money, right, and can solve a lot of problems. In the United States, we have what's called the GDP, not just in the United States, it's a term globally. And this describes the gross domestic product, in other words, all the money that's created, And right now, our GDP in the United States is about $21 trillion. So on the one hand, the bad news is even if we didn't eat or have health care or housing or spend money on anything ever, all the money we earn in a year wouldn't be enough to pay off a $28 trillion debt. The good news, though, is that we don't have to pay it off in a year. So some of what we have to figure out is (coughs) how can we organize our economy in the United States so people's basic needs are met? And so that um, at the same time, we are starting to pay down that debt and reduce our interest liability and move towards, you know, let's say something like a a fully balanced budget and a debt-free economy over the next 20 years or so. How do we do that without sacrificing our elders, without overworking working age people, and also without sacrificing things that children need? So... 
Um, and there's some good questions already coming in from the audience, like creating new industries to tax. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the answers, one of the reasons that some people at least are very excited about the idea of a Green New Deal is it will create new economic structures that don't damage the environment so that we don't have to, you know, exacerbate the problems that we faced in the last year relative to fires and storms and even the conditions that create the likelihood of a pandemic, right? So to sort of deal with those those kinds of crises, but also to build new economic structures that are sustainable and healthy for local communities. So some of it is to, you know, again, sort of just build new ways of managing economy. Um, we can also talk about the redistrib- redistribution of wealth. And Barack Obama raised that term and people immediately started yelling that he's a socialist, uh, which is kind of comical because Barack Obama is not a socialist. His, his um Policies were never such. Someone like Bernie Sander or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who do identify as socialists, would be able to break down for you very clearly why Bernie, why um, I'm sorry, Barack Obama is not a socialist. Uh, but he was saying we that our capitalist system has reached an extreme where we've got an extraordinarily extraordinary concentration of wealth in very few hands. So some of you who followed the Occupy Wall Street movement or just Uh, watch the news at the time are familiar with the term 1%. And that refers to the fact that a very, very high concentration of the money, the land, the resources, the property in the United States is concentrated in the hands of about 1% of the population. And the reason that that's a problem for our economy is that when you have so much of the resources that are created flowing into just a few portion of the people, they sit on it that wealth doesn't channel back out. It isn't spent in the economy. It isn't benefiting other people. It isn't supporting or creating new industries for the most part. It's just accruing. It's just sitting there and earning interest. And so we find that when more of the wealth is in the hands of middle-class people and we have a large middle-class and we start moving towards, moving seriously towards eliminating poverty, then people are able to build a thriving economy in a way that when most of the money is just concentrated in the hands of a few people, people can't do because they're just, try- they're just spending money on survival and not on growing the arts or building new things that are exciting or just being able to uh, give money fairly uh, in thanks and in response to the things that those are things in our, the things that those in our immediate communities create. So redistributing wealth so that there is um, possibility for more small business and so that individuals can spend money freely and fairly, right, is one of the ways in which we make the economy grow. Um, There are different ways to get about that, and there are different people in government who are advocating for or against those possibilities. But I'll just draw one attention to one more proposal in addition to the Green New Deal that I think is worth learning about, and that's uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren's proposal of a wealth tax. So what she proposes to do is to levy a tax on the uh, wealthiest portion of the United States, and it would be people basically, it would amount to a little over 100,000 families. So that's 100,000 out of 332 million people. It would basically amount to less than 1% of the population. And it would only begin with pe- with families that have uh, at least $50 million. So if you have less than $50 million, the wealth tax wouldn't apply to you. When you get $50 million, what Elizabeth Warren proposes to do is to apply a 2% tax each year on your wealth. To basically say, you've got so much money that unless you throw it away, right, you would never have a way to spend it on yourself in your lifetime, you should have to give some of that back to the economy. There have been some protests saying, well, that could be unconstitutional. And most of those arguments have been successfully rebutted, basically saying, look, we do this. We charge property tax on people's homes, right? We just tax what people have and make them pay for it. We charge inheritance taxes. We can do this on wealth in general as well. And if Elizabeth Warren were successful in just redistributing basically two cents of the dollar or 2% 
back from those wealthiest sectors, while it wouldn't eliminate all of that $28 trillion debt, it would pump enough money into the federal budget that it would essentially eliminate or eliminate most of that annual deficit, at least in what we expect to be our post-pandemic economy. So in other words, just the wealth tax would go a long way towards getting to the point where we're not spending more than we're bringing in each year. So we have a bunch of different problems to solve. One, how do we get a balanced budget, meaning how do we have what we have coming in each year exceed what we need to spend? Um, And Elizabeth Warren has one proposal um, undoing the corporate tax bill uh, from the initial Trump presidency is another proposal to start getting corporations to have to pay fairly. We saw Amazon's, for instance, tax liability is basically zero when we add up all the tax credits that they're receiving. Um, and so what we see is that corporations have so many different ways in which they can legally avoid paying taxes that they are accumulating a lot of wealth that they're not paying back into the economy. So corporate taxation, Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax, all of these are some of the proposals that people are putting forth to bring us back into balance. The last thing that, so these are some of the different proposals that are out there that I think are interesting and that I continue to learn more about. The last thing that I want to put out is that we can also solve part of the problem by combating waste. So one of the things that we see, and we have a long documented history, for instance, of money flowing in, for instance, to military sectors for resources that are not actually needed. So for instance, let's say that the military gets a certain allocation each year to buy toolkits And um, there's a company that has contracts with the U.S. government to provide the toolkits. And then Congress um, says, "Okay, well, we're going to we're going to go ahead and pass this budget and we're going to allow all these items, you know, to go into the military. And they'll do that without verifying that the military actually needs the toolkits. Right. And so then what will happen is that in order for. Um, the military to get the new toolkits, um, they will basically order their staff to throw away the ones they have, even if they're unopened, so that they can get a new allocation. And we see this happen across different sectors. We throw away enough food surplus in the United States, meaning growers, right, farmers, dispose of enough food to feed everyone who is hungry in the United States, And at the same time, we're subsidizing farming in the United States. And I'm not saying we should cut farm subsidies. I'm saying one of the things that we can do is start to create social programs so that we don't waste food, which then will eliminate some of the burden on counties and states of dealing with hunger and extreme poverty. Um, Shanna is is asking, was was Amazon's lack of tax um, liability part to part? Uh, due to research and development, in part, but not in whole. Um, And again, those loopholes allowing companies to um, find different shelters uh, for income so that they don't have to pay any tax back out in revenue still can be questioned. Uh, So, you know, so we can talk about across different sectors, looking at the ways in which fraud is happening, looking at the ways in which waste is happening. And just to give you a sense, I'm just looking up the contemporary figures. The U.S. government um, has some acknowledgement of the cost of waste each year. I don't want to give you the wrong figure. I should have had this on hand. All right, I will check. And if I find it next week, I'll be sure to share it. Um, But what we basically see is that billions of dollars in the United States at least go each year um, to waste, to things that don't actually come back to us in any particular respect. So eliminating waste, better oversight, not spending money on things that are not actually needed, um, countering and eliminating fraud, and then redistributing, you know, and then we can look at these other kinds of proposals, the conversion to green energy, um, and the uh, elimination of it, some of the most extreme wealth disparities that we have now are some of the proposals that I would say are fairly mainstream, meaning people in elected office are proposing them and uh, they're gaining some popular support. 
and we could talk more about those that are innovative or perceived as radical um, in the Q&A after. Um, but I want to go ahead and share a book recommendation, and this is by, uh, the title of the book is Give People Money, How a Universal Basic Income Would End Poverty, Revolutionize Work, and Remake the World. And the author is Annie Lowry. Again, that book recommendation is Give People Money, How a Universal Basic Income Would End Poverty, Revolutionaries Work, and Remake the World. And though I won't try to anticipate her thesis, what I will say is that what she explores is the reality that as long as people are kept poor, the economy as a whole suffers, right? So if we, if we eliminate poverty, we see that people are actually able to contribute in ways that go far beyond survival. So she makes that argument, that case, and I'll invite you to explore it for yourself. Uh, so let's see, last but not least for today's session, I want to go ahead and do our weekly civics trivia. And with our Zoom attendees, I'll share screen so that you can see the questions visually, and I'll read them out for our podcast audience. So again, civics trivia. And our first question for today is, what is the primary federal office responsible for managing funding for the executive branch? So this is everything under the presidency. Option A is the Office of Management and Budget. Option B is the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. Option C is the Office of Federal Financial Management. And option D is the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. And the right option is A, the Office of Management and Budget. And you may have been hearing about that recently as uh, President Biden's nominee, nominee to run that office near a Tandon did not make it through Senate confirmations. Uh, most of you, if not all of you, are quite familiar with the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, which is responsible for collecting taxes, but not for managing what's done with that taxes. And the latter two options, the Office of Federal Financial Management and the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, are both branches within the Office of Management and Budget. So the primary federal office that runs money for the executive branch, now this is not for Congress, right, but for the executive branch, is the Office of Management and Budget. What is a government shutdown? That's our next question. So A, it's what happens when certain offices of a government are activated in a national, or deactivated, excuse me, in a national security emergency. B, it's what happens when the government cannot afford to cover its spending for a time period. C, it what, it's what happens when government agencies are under investigation for defrauding funds. Or D, it, what, it's what happens when Congress has failed to pass an annual budget before the last round of budget funding expires. And the right answer on this one is D. It doesn't mean that the government cannot afford to cover its spending. A government shutdown happens when the government has not released the funds to cover the costs of governing because Congress has failed to agree on and pass a budget. And of course, many of us have, many if not all of us have experienced that in recent years. Oh, I'm not sure what happened to our third question. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Our PowerPoint slides here seem to not be the most updated one, so we'll just go with two for today. Uh, so I want to thank our podcast audience for tuning in and listening, and please join us next week uh, when our guest will be Professor Hiroshi Motomura, who is the founding faculty director of the Center for Immigration Law and Policy at the UCLA School of Law. And he will be joining us for a conversation about citizenship. So I hope many of you will join us then. And for the following weeks as we have our introduction to state governments. And then on March 31st, and that's a Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 o'clock Eastern time for our monthly film screening of Lake of Betrayal, which focuses on the Kinswa River Dam and the U.S. government's violations of its treaty with the Seneca people. 
and we'll be joined on that day uh, by Dr. Mishana Goman from the Tanawanda Band of Seneca, who will be there for some conversation and commentary after the film. So I hope to see many of you then on the 31st. And again, for our listening audience, thank you so much for joining us.